happened last year. And, you know, I can tell you from just my two weeks being in the office that there is a ton of preparation that goes into doing this, okay? Um, just by a show of hands, how many of you are already registered to go to the conference? Okay, all right. And how many of you guys want to be registered to go to the conference? You don't have to raise your hands. Um, but we would ask that people that want to go to the conference, that you know, maybe this video kind of sparked a little bit of interest for you, we'd ask you guys to register for Tuesday. And the reason why we want you guys to register is because when we take time, when we set aside time to worship God, to seek God's heart, God moves in a very, very special way. Okay, and so um, what I'm going to be sharing today is a little bit about that, um, but we want to make sure that everyone that has the opportunity to, uh, to go to the conference, we want you guys to come, all right? And if you have a friend that you want to invite, um, talk to me. We want to do something special for that person. If there's uh, someone that doesn't know Jesus, we want to do something special for that person. If there's someone that, if you're here for the first time or the first couple of times and you want to go to this conference, we want you to be a part of that. All right, so come and see me. Um, we have Brother Poe also. I, don't, I haven't seen him yet this morning, um, but if you see him, um, you know, reach out because we want you guys to sign up for this conference because this whole thing is dedicated to worshiping and to setting aside time for God so that God can move. And when God moves, guess what? We usually want more of that. And so what we're going to do on Tuesday night, so after the conference, this is this coming weekend, by the way, sorry about that. Um, the Tuesday after, we're not going to do our regular Tuesday prayer meeting. We're going to do a combined prayer meeting with everybody, okay? And we're going to rejoice in what God has done together, and we're going to continue to seek more. Because when you get a little bit from God, you know what? You want more. You can't have just one. I cannot remember what slogan that's, that's from, whether it's Pringles or, or what, but when you taste just a little bit, Lay's potato chips, when you taste just a little bit, you want more. And we don't want this just to be the highlight of your year. We want this to be the springboard for your year. We want this to be the jumping off point for your relationship with God for 2019. We want, or, and 2020 and 2021, you know, all of that, but we want this to not just be a one-time event that we do every year at Labor Day Conference. We want this to be a milestone in your life. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the message, um, and then I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Brother Will. But this concept of setting aside time is something that is very near and dear to me. When I was shared the last time, I talked about our kids' camps, and we would work for months and months and months just for four or five days, uninterrupted, where we could just get together, you know, play, worship God in that way, do a ton of different things because God moves when you make time for him. And so for today, I'm going to be talking out of the gospel of Mark. And the reason why is because Mark, when he wrote, you know, as he's... Um, writing the, the, the book of Mark and interpreting for Peter and, and all that good stuff, he is a man who is interested in action. So in the book of Mark, or the gospel of Mark, there is nothing more important to him than what God is doing, okay? So a lot of the gospels, they talk about the teachings of Jesus and stuff like that. Mark is not so much on the parables and the teaching. He's about the actions of Jesus, all right? And so from the beginning, okay, from the beginning of, of the book of Mark, he doesn't mess around. The first verse uh, in Mark, I believe it's, on, uh, it's up there. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Okay, this is the first verse in, in the first chapter of the book. He's not beating around the bush at all. He's saying the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, you know, Matthew doesn't talk about Jesus being the Messiah until about <laughs> almost halfway through, okay? Mark talks about this right from the beginning, and I love that about Mark, okay? So when we talk about preparation, there was a preparation that happened immediately after our fall from grace, okay? So when God was in the, um, when, when God created Adam and Eve and they were in the garden and they were having regular fellowship with Jesus, 
And the certain ca- serpent came and kind of convinced Eve that she could take of the fruit. And then she convinced Adam, or, you know, that's the story the guys like to say, right? That the woman convinced man, and that's why man fell. We can argue about that. Um, from the fall of man, we have been, uh, God has been preparing to restore us. And so when you look in Genesis chapter 3, it talks about how the Son of Man would crush the head of the serpent, okay? Um, when we go a little bit further, we look at Abraham. Um, this is Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Um, well, it's, well, I think 2 and 3. Um, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, so we see God's preparation for what God's going to do because of the fall of man as far back as Genesis, as far back as the beginning, but also at the beginning of the patriarchs, all right? So when God wants to do something, he prepares it for us. So what was the preparation for Jesus' ministry, right? There's all the prophecies and stuff like that that have been leading up to it. But in, you know, at the, sorry about that, in Gospels, in the Gospels, there's someone that prepares the way. Um, Mark, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 3. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. This is in reference to the prophecies found in Malachi and in Isaiah, okay? So John the Baptist comes and he prepares the way. He starts baptizing people. This is the guy out in the desert with the camel hair, eating the locusts and the honey, all right? There is a preparation that happens even for Jesus' ministry. Now, if Jesus were to just come down here and start doing what he was doing, do you think we would have paid attention? Probably. But that shows the importance. God is a God of order. God doesn't do anything halfway. He does it all the way, and he sends John the Baptist ahead of him to talk about repentance, okay? So what are we doing in our lives to prepare to experience Jesus, okay? So all this preparation goes in to Jesus' ministry and the, the restoration of man, but what are we doing in 2019 to receive from Jesus? Where are our hearts, Okay, Where are, where's our focus, all right? Um, do we set aside time in the morning to read the word, to pray, to seek after God? Do we kind of get up, take a shower, hit, you know, hit the car, get to work, go through work, 11.30 at night, <laughs> we're going to bed and we're like, oh yeah, devotions, guilty sometimes, <laughs> okay? But if we don't spend the time preparing ourselves, it gets really, really hard, Okay? Now, for those of us that are, are doing everything that we're supposed to do, are we, is there someone that we need to forgive? It's really, really hard for us to prepare ourselves to receive from God when we haven't forgiven. Do you know how you want Jesus to reveal himself to you? Understanding what you want from God is a very important aspect of preparing your heart for him. All right. Um, as I stated earlier, Mark's record, uh, R- Mark records more miracles, he was about action, more acts of Jesus than any of the other Gospels. All right. And I have, uh, there's a ton of miracles in the uh, Gospel of Mark, and we're going to work through three of them very quickly. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Um, then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Okay? So there's something very important, and you're going to find this out in the the next two examples that I use. But he pleaded, this is Jairus pleading with Jesus, he pleaded earnestly with him. Okay? Do you think Jairus was just kind of walking around on the street and then he saw Jesus and was like, oh, yeah, my daughter's sick. You know, uh, maybe, maybe I should ask him. Or, you know, he should know. I mean, if he's the son of God, then he should know. Okay. Um, the next example is, in fact, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. 
First let the children eat all they want, Jesus told her. He told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. This woman was not a Jew. She was not a part of the, the nation of Israel. She was a foreigner. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demons have left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Okay? That's example number two. She comes and asks him. Right? And not only does she just ask him, she also pushes. He's like, oh, you know, we're not supposed to give the, the blessings to outsiders. And she's like, no, 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 but, you know, this. One more example. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped him and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and follow Jesus along the road, okay? So the three things that these uh, miracles have in common is that when Jesus, inter or when Jesus is interacting with people and people come with him with specific requests, Jesus grants them. In the book of Mark, whenever someone comes to Jesus with a specific request, that in the recorded miracles, Jesus acts, okay? And, and this is a unique one because Jesus comes to the... Uh, um, has the people bring Bartimaeus to him, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Okay, Bartimaeus could have said, well, you know, just make sure that I have enough food and housing and all this stuff for, for the rest of my life, and, I, and I'm good. Okay? What does he say? I want to see. I want to see. All right? So where do you want to see Jesus move in your life? What are the specific requests that you have that you want God to move in your life, okay? I want you to have that in mind. Those of you that are coming to the conference, great. Even in our daily walk, we should have our petitions ready for Jesus. When Jesus asks us, what can I do for you? We need to be ready with a response, all right? Um, my apologies. So this is something that these individuals are asking of Jesus for themselves, okay? But should we be keeping God's blessing only for ourselves? I don't believe so, all right? And since Mark is a man of action and he's a proactive character, there is this really, really cool miracle that happens in uh, Mark chapter 2. All right, and it's these guys that are so proactive. All right, they say some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then they lo uh, then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, "Son, your sins." Are forgiven. So this is a unique scenario, right? Jesus responds with the positive yes and, you know, and forgives the man's sin and the man got up and walked, all right? But this one involved his friends. This man couldn't get to Jesus. Not only could he not get to Jesus on his own two feet, the crowds were so thick in the building, he could not get access to Jesus. Who are the people in our lives that we need to let down through a roof? Are we willing to take the risk? that They didn't own this roof. This roof belonged to somebody else. Are we willing to damage property for our friends to receive a touch of Jesus? Are we ready to have to explain ourselves afterwards and be like, well, you know, sorry. Or are we going to just sit back and say, oh, you know what? It was, it was too hard. I couldn't do it. No. Mark talked about the proactiveness of these men and their faith. What are you willing to do to make sure others receive their own touch of Jesus in their lives? Okay. 
And I bring all of these examples up because then comes the comparison. All right? So all of these people have come to Jesus with specific requests. These people have come to Jesus knowing that he can heal them. All right? But then by comparison, Mark talks about the religious leaders. So Mark chapter 8, verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus to test him. They asked him for a sign from heaven. So how does this compare to everything else? We, we see specific requests. And then we see the religious leaders and they are like, oh, show us a sign from heaven. Um, the next slide is John's account. Of, of this. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Okay, there is no specificity in this request. They want Jesus to put on a magic show so that they can believe in him. Okay, and what do we know about Jesus' response to that? He said, no, you've this wicked generation right? You are not going to see any signs. Jesus was already performing signs and miracles, but they couldn't see it, all right? So we need to have our plan of action. We need to have our minds, our hearts prepared for Jesus to move. This conference is a phenomenal marker for us. If you haven't signed up, I urge you, sign up, come, be a part, all right? But when you come, know exactly what it is you're hoping to receive from God, right? Don't just come because it's the thing we do every single year, all right? And through all of this, and this is something that um, God laid on my heart, you know, Jesus doesn't perform magic tricks for us just so that we can see and applaud and do that stuff, okay? When we come to the conference, when we set aside time, we need to be very, very conscientious of the fact that we need Jesus more than we need the sign. We need Jesus more than we need the miracle. We need Jesus more than we need air to breathe, all right? So don't just focus on the receiving part. Ask for Jesus, okay? Understand that Jesus' goodness, faithfulness, abundance, that's where, this, that's where the miracles and the receiving comes from. All right, but you need to be like the song says. Help me, um, help me want the healer more than the healing. Help me want the savior more than the saving. Okay, make sure that your priorities are lined up correctly. Okay, I'm going to turn this time over to Brother Will, um, but you know, it, just in preparation, okay, know what it is that you're expecting from God for this conference, for this week, for this month, for this year, because God. Jesus wants to move and wants to put a special touch on our lives.